Good morning. My name's Terry Makings and I'm a Governor of the Shrine of Remembrance. On behalf of the trustees, governors and the wider Shrine family, we thank the Submariners Association for continuing to arrange this important annual service. They who served this country in conflict and survived, and those who made the supreme sacrifice, are appropriately commemorated by this splendid war memorial. As we can see, it is a monument of beauty, created, carved and built to perfection. It is the result and the outcome of Victoria's gratitude, their agony, Victoria's pride. The oldest and the youngest of those who died did so that we, their countrymen, might live our lives to the fullest. And may we be worthy of their sacrifice. On behalf of everyone present and watching via the webcast, our condolences to the Royal Family on the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Long live the King. The address today will be given by Commander Martin Grant Holzberger, Member of the Order of Australia, Conspicuous Service Cross, Royal Australian Navy. He joined the Navy as a general entry sailor and started his training as a submariner in 1987. He experienced postings to the United Kingdom and the United States of America as he rose through the ranks to become the seventh warrant officer of the Navy in 2012. He relinquished that post in 2016 and subsequently gained his commission. He experienced active service in the Middle East. In 2010, he was listed in the Queen's Birthday Honours, being awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross for his extraordinary work as the ship's warrant officer in HMAS Warramunga. In 2015, he was again listed in the Australia Day Honours, being awarded a member of the Order of Australia for exceptional performance in leadership and management. Commander Holzberger is now the Executive Officer of HMAS Cerberus, a much sought after appointment. But before I invite Commander Holzberger to the lectern, please stand. As the catafalque takes post. Please be seated. I now invite Commander Holzberger to the lectern. Uh, thank you, Commander Maker, for that uh, kind introduction. President of the Victorian branch of the Submarine Association is Keith Hatfield, uh, Secretary of the Submarine Association of Victoria, Ian Tanner, uh, my fellow submariners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd also like to acknowledge the passing of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II and hope that you all had very fond memories of her. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we gather here today, the Bungarong people of the Kulin Nation. I wish to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and my respects to all those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who have served our country. It is said that a ship is safe in harbour, but that's not what a ship is built for. Warships are built for purpose. They're built to fight and win in an environment that can be harsh and unforgiving, where one's mistake or, ma or malfunction can result in the loss of the vessel or crew. This afternoon, we gather to reflect on the service of AE1 and AE2. They hold a very special place in our nation's military history. AE1 
and its sister submarine, AE2, were built in Vickers, at, at, built by Vickers in Barrow Inverness, England, for the Royal Australian Navy and launched in 1913. At, the end, at, at that time, the E-class submarines were represented as the latest technological development in submarine design, fitted with forward, aft, and side torpedo tubes. The Australian submarines carried eight torpedoes and could run at 15 knots or 28 kilometres an hour surfaced and nine, nine knots or about 16 and a half kilometres an hour dived. Although they were larger than the earlier class of submarines, accommodation for the crews on this 54 metre boat was still cramped. With the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914, the two submarines were sent from Sydney to German New Guinea with the Australian Naval and Military Expedition Forces to help capture the German colonies. On the 14th of September 1914, a day after the official German surrender of the colony, AE-1, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Thomas Byzant, left for Ball Harbour on patrol of Cape Gazelle. It never returned. A mystery sent 35 crew to a watery grave off Papua New Guinea. AE-1's final contact with the destroyer HMAS Parramatta at 2.30pm placed it in the area. AE-1 was later seen at about 3.30, apparently returning to Rabaul, but it never arrived. When it was determined she was missing at 8pm, a search commenced and an expanded search the following day. A search by five Navy ships in the days following failed to find the submarine, nor any telltale skimmer of, of oil floating on the surface of the water, nor distress calls to help find or guide the search. Enemy, and action, enemy action was not expected in the area. The only German vessel nearby for some time was a small survey ship. On the 20th of December 2017, the wreck was discovered under 300 metres of water during a search off the Duke of York Islands near the former East, New, East Britain capital Rabaul. It was the 14th attempt to find the vessel and the resting place of its crew. Nico Island villagers at the time also spoke of seeing a monster or a devil fish that appeared and quickly disappeared back into the depths. The success of the 2017 AE-1 expedition is attributed to the expert knowledge and efforts provided the AE-1 search and the, and the expertise gained from the AE-2 project in Turkey, as well as a search for the Malaysian aircraft flight MH370 in the deep waters of the Indian Ocean. It is also greatly attributed to the advance in deep water search techniques, including the, the, the drop camera of 3,000 metres and high-powered LED lamps improving visibility. I also acknowledge that this was to the tenacity of many others to help continue to find this vessel. This is after we gathered a... <laughs> In April 2018, high-definition cameras helped produce a 3D model of the wreck. Experts who analysed the wreck believe that the HMAS AE-1 sank after a, after a ventilation valve in the hull was left partially open when the, when the sub dived. It is not clear as what, whether it was human error or mechanical failure that caused the fault. However, with the valve open, water would have flooded into the engine room. As AE-1 sank, to its 100 metre crutch depth, the implosion would have ripped through the vessel, killing all on board instantly, as noted by the Australian National Maritime Museum report. AE-1 was the first Australian warship lost in operations. With the AE-1 discovery, we can now provide answers to the families and a nation who still mourns the loss of those courageous crew and we have solved the oldest mystery of Australian naval history. AE-2 remained in Rabaul area until the 4th of October 1914, when it proceeded to Fiji to join the other Australian and French ships. After three weeks, the German threat had greatly diminished. 
the AE-2 was ordered back to Sydney. In December, it joined a second Australian Imperial Force troop carrier convoy heading to Al to, from Albany, Western Australia, for Europe. And in February 1915, it joined the Royal, Royal Navy Squadron operating in the Aegean Sea. AE-2 achieved fame when, when it penetrated the Dardanelles waterway in Turkey at the same time Australian troops landed in Gallipoli. Commanded by Lieutenant Commander Henry Stoker, AE-2 was ordered to sail through the Dardanelles and run amok. In the Sea of Mamara, no other submarine had managed to breach the heavily mined and defended channel. But in the early hours of the 25th of April, 1915, AE-2 went safely through. After, emerging the Turkish, after engaging a Turkish torpedo boat, it reached the Sea of Mamara and, ma and remained at large for five days before sustaining imperable damage from the Ottoman troops. Stoker was eventually forced to sink the submarine. He and his crew were taken prisoner and spent the rest of the war in, an, in Ottoman, in Ottoman um, captivity. Stoker survived and was later awarded the Distinguished Service Order. Stoker was a man of great determination who took his submarine where none had been before. He opened the straits of the, for the Royal Navy submarines to follow where he and other Australians had gone. The wreck of AE2 was located off Karabara Point in Turkey. In June 1998, AE2 was, AE2 will con sorry, was discovered in 1998. AE2 will continue to, to be protected as a site for generations to come. The discovery, exploration and protection of Stoker's submarine has written a new and much happier page in the naval history of Turkey and Australia. It has been a joint operation which depends on the skills and determination of Australian and Turkish divers, maritime archaeologists and former submariners equally. I would like to leave you with a reflection of the service of sacrifice of the crew of AE1 written by able seaman John Wheat of AE2. To the memory of our sister ship AE1 and her crew, we took the first patrol on the 13th, they took the second next day. We came back, they didn't. They lie coffined in the deep, keeping their silent watch on Australia's northern passage. Heroes all. Both, assist both sisters, AE1 and AE2, had short but distinguished careers, one which submariners continue to be proud of today. As nations, we should all be very proud of them. I would like to take this opportunity today to pay tribute to the contributions of all submariners who have served and still serve to this day. Their country, and also in particular those who pay the ultimate price in all conflicts of war and at peace. They continue to display the tenacity of those who served on AE1 and AE2. Their commitment to serve this country, their continued uphold and pass on the, the legacy of those who served our, our country as submariners lest we forget. Thank you, Commander Holzberger. I think it's quite clear that for we who only served in surface ships, commonly known as targets, we appreciate the risk that every submariner endured during their career within the Royal Australian Navy and the Royal Navy for others. And I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we do have the president of the Submariners Association, Keith Hatfield, with us today, and also the secretary, Ian Tanner, behind me, and a long-term submariner, Commander Doug Buse, who's sitting with us here today. I'd now like to introduce Chaplain Matthew Campbell, who will recite the Submariners' Prayer. Let us pray. O Father, hear our prayer to thee, for your humble servants beneath the sea. In the depths of oceans, as oft they stray, so far from night, 
so far from day. We would ask your guiding light to glow, to make their journey safe below. Please oft times grant them patient mind, then ere the darkness won't them blind. They seek thy protection from the deep. Please grant them peace where'er they sleep. Of their homes and loved ones far away, we ask you care for them each day until they surface once again to drink the air and feel the rain. We ask your guiding hand to show a safe progression, sure and slow. Dear Lord, please hear our prayer to thee for your humble servants beneath the sea. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Campbell. The wreath party will now lay wreaths. Commander Holzberger, Royal Australian Navy. We'll lay a wreath on behalf of the Royal Australian Navy. Red Bottrell. We'll lay a wreath on behalf of the Submariners Association. Lieutenant Commander Graham Thomas will lay a wreath on behalf of the Naval Association of Australia. In memoriam, Keith Hatfield and Ian Tanner will recite the names of those submariners who have passed on. It has become the custom at this service to read out the names of our past members, some of who served with distinction during World War II such as our reef layer today, Fred Bottrell, and others who served also with distinction in the Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy and other allied navies, both in peace and war. Peter John Uglow, Harry Holden Straw, Peter Scott Maxwell, Dennis Dimmott, Arthur Earl, Robert Sloan, James Dancy, Frank Neagle, George Leonard, William Littlejohn, Stan Connor, Michael Clark, James Fryer, James Skelton, Louis Charles Pryor, Bernard Hodgson, Richard Brooks, Harry Lees, Reg Willing, Keith McWade, Harry Hughes, Eric Hill, James Burke, Arthur Cooling, Jeffrey Gelly, Joe Howarth, Georges Vincent. James McTeer, Charles Bradbury, Robert Nicholson, 
Frank Johnson, Walter Murray Johns, Bill Holyoke, John Tate, Clive Taylor, Dacus Smythe, John Horlock, Michael Norton, Andre Brunard, Angus Bartlett Bragg, Dick Sear, George England, Brian Toogood, Jerry France, Dwayne Hoog, Joan Jones, Ross Cameron, Pat, ha Pat Heffernan, Dave Edson, Bob Appleton, Don Didsbury, Charles Bonnet, William Bill Bacon. Please stand for the oath. They shall not grow old as those that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. lest we forget.
catafalque party will fall out. This blood-red poppy is a symbol of remembrance. It is our connection with those that have made the supreme sacrifice and those that have passed on since. For those with the poppy, and I think Ange is going to hand out poppies as well. That concludes today's service. Thank you very much for your attendance here today. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.